Hello, and welcome to this episode of Masaro and Melania in the Morning. Melania, it's great to see you again on this wonderful, what is this? Well, I shouldn't say when we record this stuff. You <laughs> yeah, know, you I, mean, I mean, everyone, everyone should have the impression that we're recording this in the morning that it's being published, right? Yeah, it's not far off, guys, but still. It, yeah, it's not, it's not far off, but perhaps we're recording from the future. Maybe. That would, be, that, would be, that would be pretty cool, looking back into the past. But the news, I guess, in the past week, um, since Biden's visit to Kiev, a uh, pretty extraordinary feat, um, has been this, well, in, in the American far right, this very deep and sustained effort to tarnish his visit, as well as once again um, try to paint Ukraine as, as something that Americans should not support. Um, they've done this in a couple of ways, but one that I'd love to get your take on, um, this is kind of the what is in the I mean, again, this is this is not in the news. This is on Tucker. Right. I mean, to say it's in the news is kind of is kind of goofy. Yeah, um, because Tucker is not the news. Tucker is some wackadoo who goes and spouts <laughs> off about whatever he's feeling um, yeah. that particular day. Uh, but there's this sustained narrative about how President Biden should have been in East Palestine, Ohio, which is a town that I think, I mean, it's not, you know, most Americans up until now have probably never heard of it. That's not necessarily their fault. It's not a bad thing. You know, I mean, it's it's a small town in Ohio. Uh, there was a train derailment. Um, and the the narrative is, well, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about East Palestine? Why was, why was Biden... Melania, why was Biden not in East Palestine, Ohio? Why, what was he doing? And where, where was it? In Kiev, Ukraine? I mean, we don't even know where Ukraine is. It, why does he care so much? Why isn't, he, why isn't he in his own country? I think you can... Appro- so the approach to this problem, quote-unquote, um, is threefold, I think. Uh, first one being that, you know, I mean, the train derailments are horrible and they shouldn't happen, and it's it's sad and horrible that, that they happened, and of course this should be addressed. Uh, but, I mean, we have the same problem in Ukraine. Often people treat uh, top-tier politicians, you know, heads of states, as some sort of, like, handy man who just, if they show up in a place where something bad happened, that stuff somehow immediately gets fixed. I mean, of course, there is symbolism to visiting these things, and I'm not saying that one thing is more important than the other. But and then the second approach, which is kind of goes out of the first one, is, I mean, it Biden visiting Kiev is not just like his whim or tourism or something that is less important than train derailment. You cannot compare these things, obviously, but um, it is of great importance and it was ridiculously important that 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 Biden visits Ukraine for so many reasons we could list them forever but may, the, the the main one is that it shows first of all if we, we're not even talking about Ukrainians interest in this right because we we love when presidents come here and it, it really helps our morale and how we feel and, uh, and you know, and that the world supports us. And if but, I could add, uh, yeah. first time, I mean, it's not just the timing of President Biden coming, but it's the first time in 15 years that a president has gone to Ukraine. So, so every president, okay, every single one since the collapse of the Soviet Union has gone to powwow with the Russian president. Yes. Almost immediately yes. upon coming into office. But this is the first time in 15 years that a president has gone to Ukraine which of the two, Ukraine and Russia, as we have established on the show, Ukraine is the open, free democracy, not yeah, Russia. Yeah. So it's not, but it's not only just that. It's so, it also shows, you know, um, that America is not afraid to stand up for, for the good in the world. And isn't that what we've been talking about all along? It's not just a matter of showing up some place and standing there taking a couple of pictures it's about I, I just tweeted about this the same day i mean president biden was closer 
to the front line of Ukrainian-Russian war than Putin ever was, and he's the one who just started the war. So it just shows, you know, that you know the civilized world is not scared, and that it's not going to, you know, uh, get blackmailed or scared by by this evil. Um, and it's very important for America because, I mean, um, uh, United States are. I mean, a lot of people just live their lives, and they, you know, don't address this. Uh, to an extent that they probably shouldn't, don't think about it. But, you know, the U.S. should, you know, take part in all these processes. It's it's a great country that stands for the good. It is, you know, and, and it should, you know, do what it declares. So it was perfectly natural. And then the third part, I mean, it's... I could not begin to explain to you how important it was for 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 ukrainians you could not uh, understand it because it is something that only you know it's it's a lot of the times heads of states come here and it's often overlooked uh, like nobody i mean when the war started obviously everything changed but before that it was like oh, well they are coming here they're talking to our president but it it just gave such a boost to everything we've been doing here, and you know Ukrainians really love it when Duda, the P Polish president, comes here because they're yeah. like friends with Zelensky. But this time it was he's even, been great. Yeah, I mean he's a, he's an awesome he's an awesome friend of Ukraine. But it was very special this time. It was very special, you know, seeing these two leaders of the free world, you know, just walking around, looking around. Um, and it was like a, it's, it's unity for Ukrainians. It's very important because the U.S. is so far away. And Biden is so far away from so many Ukrainians, like, what, thousands of miles away. And I've been reading up, uh, uh, like, a lot on the Internet about this. People were as excited as they were. I can't even compare. Since I guess when, I think it's like the same kind of sentiment uh, I got when, when we liberated Kherson. I mean that was still, you know, very a bit different, but people were well, like all over this. It was very important. So yeah, that's why he was here. And I'm not trying to, you know, um, kind of. Of course, derailments in 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 that town, you know, that should be addressed. But there's so much more at stake here, sadly, um, and 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 that's President Biden's job as well. Yeah, and, and I might just add to, 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 to your point that it was so important to Ukrainians. It's also extremely important to Americans and the national security of the United States. I mean, you know, him, I mean, the president fundamentally, I mean, I mean, I would say the most important job of the president and the federal government is the national security of the United States. I mean, I mean, that's, that's why the federal government exists. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the Constitution sets out that this, you know, this federal government is primarily built to secure, you know, ensure the national security of the United States. There's other stuff too. And then people argue this or that, or the other thing is national security. I've been there, you know, I mean, you know, I, I've argued very, I think, uh, effectively that corruption is a national security threat, but, but the, na but national security is ultimately, um, the prerogative of the federal government yes. and it's prime, it's primary responsibility. Um, and when it comes to deterring, um, you know, Russia, when it comes to um, bolstering and emboldening Ukrainians to, to, to keep up the fight and to protect themselves and to protect us. I mean, as I've said before on this show, and I, I don't think you can say it enough, our investment in Ukraine is the best national security investment we have ever made. It's unbelievable the extent to which. Ukrainians take every penny we give them and turn it into a dollar. I mean, it's a hundred times what we've put in, and it's the same with this kind of moral support. Um, oh, you know, Biden's visit uh, has humongous returns. I mean, it, it's something that will be remembered by Ukrainians forever, forever, forever. It's and not just you know, it's not about you know, like uh, it's not like 2014 or 16 or 18. Because, I mean, there was war back then, and it's very important that we never forget it. But actual, we had actual cruise missiles all over the place. And the fact that he came now is that's going to be in the history f forever. And this is going to be sort of, I'm sorry, a benchmark 
where all the other presidents will have to, you know, try to reach as well. Because, I mean, I, I was worried, actually. Imagine if something happened. I mean, yeah. insanity. But And I know that these risks were terrible. And I know how the team was, how everything was kept a secret, how he was advised not to go after all. But imagine, <laughs> that's, that's bravery, that's courage. I, and I, 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 I commend that. It, 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 it absolutely is. And it came at a very critical time, too, when, you know, Ukrainians are having to face down this, you know, renewed Russian offensive. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the morale boost is really important given the timing. Um, yeah, I just actually like little, little uh, uh, detail. I just went to the east of Ukraine uh, last week. I went to Donbass. And yeah. I've seen firsthand, I've talked to our troops who are currently in Bakhmut. Uh, I've spoken to people from Slavyansk, Konstantinivka. I stayed in Kramatorsk for a full two days. And even there, it means a lot to these people. These, like our troops, they're very tired. It's been, re it, the fighting in, in Bakhmut is unimaginable. I couldn't begin to explain. And living there and you know, being there is very difficult. But even they talk about it. For them, it is also, it was, it was a whole thing. And imagine how much they have on their plate. But still, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean, I so let's uh, let's get into what this is then, because this is a you know, obviously this is an attempt. I think I you know, I, I think from almost a, as objective as one can get, one can pretty uh, confidently say Biden's visit to Kiev was a triumph. I mean, it was you know, I, I have been critical of this administration, particularly it's you know, hesitancy to provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs um, and kind of the hand wringing around, you know, designating Russia a state sponsor of terror and all this other kind of stuff. But this was great. I mean, yeah. it was it was it was great. You know, I, I think everyone can see it. I, I think a lot of Republicans, sort of mainstream Republicans, even were like, you know, good job, get Ukraine the weapons. But, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of the kind of the mm, OK, you did. You did good. Um, however, you know, there's there's certainly those that are very loath to admit this and, and, and want to find every single way to, uh, you know, tarnish this president, um, regardless of his actions, which, you know, to me is is a sad thing and I think is is not good for democracy. But here we are. And what they've resorted to here is something that was very often used in the Soviet Union. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a the, the strategy of whataboutism. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 Melania, you've seen what about him pretty much everywhere. Yeah? yeah. I mean, this is so, so let's, what, I mean, what is, what are your thoughts on, on what's going on here? I mean, is this the, is this the Sovietization of American political discourse? Is this, I mean, is there, is there anything to this beyond uh, a kind of blatant Soviet style propaganda? Um, I wouldn't even call it that, even it's even though it's very similar. Um, it just just again, you have to really unwrap it to see it for what it is, because um, it's about <clears throat> politicians wanting to tarnish the reputation of their opponents so much that they are willing to overlook the tragedy that is happening in Ukraine right now. So uh, being a winner and ruining somebody's like political rating is more important to them than acknowledging, you know, what 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 people in Ukraine need is more important. I would say to them than the national security of the United States. Yeah, th th those are you see that's it. like when you look as a person uh, like at a politician, we can treat him both as a politician and as a human being. And people look at two things when they, you know, vote for somebody or sympathize with somebody. So, of course, for it, it, and it's it, in in both these instances, the situation is terrible because as a politician, they would much rather, you know, you know, talk bad things about Biden and say how he's wrong, even though he's protecting U.S.'s uh, national, uh, uh, you know, uh, interests in uh, in that regard, but also as a human being who's like, because it's not just about him visiting Ukraine, it's about people use Ukraine as an excuse, um, kind of, like, you don't vote for Biden because Ukraine. 
And when you look into it, um, it just means that genocide and deaths don't mean anything to these people. It's, it's, it's a personal thing. And I think it matters a lot it should matter a lot as well, not just political stance of somebody or their treatment of their job. It's, it's a very... Um, I, I, I now um, kind of make my opinions about people. I know it's, it, it, it's a bit um, subjective, obviously, but for me, um, you can say a lot about a person depending on what their stance on Ukraine is. Yes. Because in, even though I'm a Ukrainian, but... Putting that aside, every time I hear something about, you know, some horrible things that are happening to human beings en masse, you know, for instance, I know concentration camps in China. I mean, I, I feel for these people. This is terrible. I'm not saying stuff like, well, it's their business. They should figure. No, it's not. That's not the society we've built. So when a person says things like, well, he shouldn't visit Ukraine because that shouldn't be our business. It just speaks a lot to what this person is on a personal level. And then you add the fact that these people will much rather have President of the United States not go anywhere and not defend national security, which is a completely different thing. But then again, those are different audiences, I believe. Those are, those are different people. I keep saying this thing, uh, which I think is not talked about enough. You can't. No, you don't have to like Biden. You can be against him. It's a, we, you, the U.S. is a free country. We live in a free world. You're free to choose or support whoever you want. But being against Biden doesn't automatically mean you have to be against Ukraine. You can do both. It's fine. It's not mutually exclusive. Well, look at, look at Leader McConnell. I uh, yes, mean, he's, exactly. He's out, he's out pretty much every day saying... You know, Ukrainian victory is the most important thing that that must happen today in order to secure American national security. I mean, he's he's doing a fantastic job. He's doing this. a good job as a politician and as a person. Um, I know for a as fact as a politician that, and as a leader, as a of leader, the country. yes, 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 exactly. But I know so many people that will. For some reason, I mean, it, we're talking again about mostly these like fringe groups and these, as you call them, wackadoos, that will actually use Ukraine as an argument why Biden, why Biden's policy is bad and why Americans shouldn't support him, which is so twisted and kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it just makes no sense to me because isn't this what we've been talking about for the, all these years, you know, freedom, rights, all these things. I don't know how in somebody's brain these two two things can kind of coexist. Well, well, it's seeing everything through the lens of partisan politicization, and it's basically making that the top priority to override all other priorities, including the survival of the country. So, I yeah. mean, you're 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 basically in this mind rotted state where you know, okay, let's say. Okay. There's a humanitarian catastrophe. Well, for a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people, you know, can't comprehend or react to every single humanitarian catastrophe. So, I mean, you know, there's some people that do and it really affects them. You know, some people are kind of numbed. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that's hard. So then there's the second thing, national security. So let's say you've, you've written that. Okay, so this is a really important national security um, uh, thing for the United States. So you have to ignore that. Yeah. So that that has to not. And then, okay. Well, the the Ukrainians are you know s spiritually and ethically and morally very close to us. They're 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 fighting for freedom against a tyranny. That's very close to what America foundationally believes in. Uh, then you have to ignore that. Yeah. Have to <laughs> so ignore so that you as well. you basically have to have to go through three different sets of of really good reasons to support Ukraine and say actually none of these are as important as bashing my political opponent exactly. at and every this opportunity. Is, and this is when we come to what you said in the very beginning about the Sovietization of this political discourse. Exactly, yeah. Because you're either with your party or you're ostracized. Yeah. And this is exactly how it worked in the Soviet Union. If you're not with us, you're against us. And, exactly. And it's a whole... And it, it, really, it really bothers me, actually, because it just... Um, I'm scared that how do we then find something that unites, you know, these two, two, two uh, camps. How, 
is it even possible at this point if th things so obvious don't always work? I mean, I would say that Ukraine uh, and uh, Russians' war against Ukraine is probably one of the few things that that actually did the job. Of course, there's always weirdness, but it helped kind of unite two very polar, uh, you know, uh, uh, groups of people. But still, it's not it's not to an extent that it should have been, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I want to say it's not necessary. The communization, let's say, of... Communization, good. That's American, a good word. Yeah. yeah, of American political discourse is not necessarily due to polarization. I, I think I think there's kind of a kind of a mix up when people think, oh well it's left and right. Well it's not. I mean I I think a lot of it a lot of closing ranks um happened before kind of the far right even arose. I think that they they yeah. they, ad they adopted a lot of tactics that were already being used and, and they used them better. I think yeah. I think they're they you know because they're because they're even wackier they're they're better at using them. I don't think it's right versus left though. I think it's, it's not. W whatever these guys are saying we're against. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's right or left or but anything guess, really. It's just I like guess. we're against the thing that you do. Whatever the thing yeah, is. Yeah. I, I mean I guess what I want to say though is that like there is a there's a risk aversion in DC that began before polarization. That's, and I think it, in, in part it helped cause polarization because there started to become this like disgust with elites because there was a risk aversion, because they weren't responding to, um, to a lot of the developments happening over the last 30 years. I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I just put out a video today basically looking at how did the hell, you know, how the heck did this, did this happen? You know, well, I mean, it's been a long time coming. You know, and 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 a lot of this was the failure of elites and a lot of it was this notion that you can't speak out, you can't disagree, you need to fall in line, you know, and, and where this came from is kind of the the big question, you know. I mean, uh I think there I mean there's a ton of different causes of that. I think it's people's post career jobs and uh kind of kind of starting this whole uh global corrupt machine where uh, there's kind of you don't question the ideology of the end of history. You don't question the ideology of economic integration. You don't question the ideology of the, the inevitability of democracy. You know, and then and then the people that would start to question that would be like, oh, wait a second, something's wrong here. You know, Russia, Russia's not our friend. Like the people that started to say this in the early 2000s, they were ostracized. Yeah, they were they were thrown out of the political discourse because the because the the notion at the time the the puritan notion was in the mainstream yeah. it was that it was that you do not question the 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 Jeffrey Sachs Larry Summers whatever economic ideology of the you know the the integration with China the integration with Russia you know and then the people that got pushed to the sides these are actually the people that ended up becoming the fringes eventually that, you know, they, yeah. they, they were the ones that these were kind of the, 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 what, what, what eventually became the far left and the far right. Now, not all of them. Some of them just quietly kept, you know, working along within the machine and now are kind of, you know, slowly having their moment as the political things changes. But I guess it's all to say that this was not that I think the polarization was a product of the communization. It was the product. It, it, it's not. It's not that polarization led to puritanism. It's that puritanism led to polarization. That's that's yeah. that's my that's my thesis anyway. That, that, that's a very good point. I'm, let, let me tell a little story from 2017 or 18 or 19. I'm not even sure at this point. So back when I worked in uh, Verkhovna Rada in Ukrainian Parliament, I worked for this very new party that was elected uh, for like a, a quite a large number, so 32 seats out of 400 and something, which is a lot for a new party that just emerged after the Revolution of Dignity. And it was a very atypical party uh, in the way how they voted because um, we kind of decided uh, at the very beginning that there were going to be five things that the party agrees on. These were along the lines of like changes to the constitution, no succession, Donbass, uh, other stuff. Uh, and then the rest was uh, like it didn't. You didn't have to vote the same way your uh, your your, your um, colleagues in, in in your party voted. So 
uh, of course, there were discussions. There were these heated arguments on these meetings of like, what do we have for agenda tomorrow? These bills, yada, yada, yada. And there were this, these things were like, do these bills fall into our five main, you know, red lines, so to speak? And the rest you can vote at your own discretion. And that was something that freaked people out in the parliament because they did not understand why the hell would the same party have on 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 these on different economics for instance not that not everybody agrees to everything you know um yeah. they were freaked they were like why do you not like vote you know everybody why is it so weird why one abstained why one was for one was against and uh, people i worked with they're like well because we are politicians we can have we can have different opinions and things that are, you know are not core to what we're doing here and i think that is that was a good thing that that was a very good thing and now it's it looks especially in american politics sadly like something unattainable well i mean while ukraine was becoming more like america america was becoming more like russia uh. like i mean there's 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 kind of this there's kind of this weird thing that like ukraine was blazing its own way post communism was like holy crap this yeah. freedom is pretty cool. Like yeah, we're going to do we're going to do all these cool things. This thing you is know? awesome. You we know? should and do I mean, more of this. And I mean the 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 I mean it's 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 actually kind of the Ukrainian uh happiness with freedom and almost like almost like ability to love freedom and be like we're back baby, you know, like <laughs> Cossacks are back, you know, and 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 this it's just kind of like this 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 like there's this there's this love of the chaos that is that underpins all freedom. In Ukraine, that that to me is the most admirable quality, and I think you, I think you find you found this at one point in America. Um, you definitely found it during the Cold War. Weirdly enough, you found a huge variety of opinions, in part because we were so insistent upon contrasting ourselves with. Um, with the authoritarian communist world, that we were like, well, we've got to allow for all this dissent. We've got to do all this. You know, we've got to allow for all these, uh, you know, different ways of thinking and, and, and independence of thought and stuff like that. And it's actually, I mean, it's kind of the, you know, people have related it to kind of the Roman defeat of Carthage or something like this. Yeah. That, like the, the, the defeat of the USSR made us more like the USSR. It made us, it made us like, oh, actually, uh, we are the grand superpower, blah, blah, blah. You can't question the doctrine. The doctrine is king. And, and I mean, that's, that's where we have been for 30 years is you know, just kind of getting sucked into this, 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 you know, economic integration based, you know, doctrine that was unquestionable. I remember people uh, like, so way before even 2014, um, people that worked in DC back in the day used to tell me stories how, you know, people from the same party had to convince people from their party to, yeah. you know, you actually had to like have pretty good compelling arguments why your thing should be supported and stuff. Whereas now it's a, t- a tad different. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally like the, the party discipline has gone up. People talk about sometimes, a, you know, I think, you know, I, I call it communization because I think it's very bad, but a parliamentarization of Congress and that like, I mean, Congress is not built to work like a parliament. You know, no. it's, it, they're, they're, they're no. independent constituencies. They do not have, we do not have party lists. There's nothing like this. So, so essentially, you know, each individual has his own voter base and is, you know, uh, but, but the, the consolidation of parties, I mean, the, 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 the United States is not built for this. Our political system is not built for this. It doesn't work well with this. All it does is put the, put the power in the hands of fewer and fewer and fewer people. Exactly. It One, just makes the circle becomes just smaller and smaller. And it, and it makes it feel pointless to, to get into politics. And you, and you see, you see this in the way that the United States has become this gerontocracy with the same people running it for decades and decades and decades and the lack of participation from young people and, and, and all of this thing. And all of this thing is the, is the result of, again, what I would see as the, as, as the communization. And that's why I think you see young people fleeing to the fringes because the fringes seem free. I mean, I mean as crazy as they are, they seem like a place where you can – challenge the status yeah. quo yeah. which which is which is what it's all about so if the if the status quo doesn't allow uh for a place for young people to challenge the status quo then the fringes will allow for it you know um and then the the people will be co-opted into these 
you know, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not endorsing fringe movements, but I think that this is the this is the consequence of not allowing for a place for free and open debate. This is very interesting because this is very, very true because they do get more freedom. The, the crazier it gets, the, the, the more you, you get, you know, to criticize the order that is, you know, ineffective for those people. They, they, I mean, it doesn't work this way. Maybe it will work the other way. We all know it won't. But, um, ah, this is a very interesting thought. <laughs> well, this is why they talk a lot about horseshoe theory, you know, yeah. that, that, that you have like the far left and the far right meeting on a lot of points. And they are. And I, and I guess I'm torn, of course, because I don't agree with the fringes policy wise. In fact, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm very supportive of uh, Ukraine. So, so, I mean, you know, I, I think in that sense, you know, both fringes, both the far left and the far right have been very, very wrong. And I mean, yes. the far right, of course, makes its, makes itself known more um, vitriolically, toxically, all that kind of stuff. But let's not forget that there was that far left letter last October with 30 members of Congress yeah. saying that we that Ukraine needs to surrender. So, I mean, you know, there's this is this is this exists in both fringes. It's just, you know, I think that the the, the far left, um, because because really Ukraine is a way to bash Biden and they're not really, you know, they don't really need to bash Biden as often. They kind of talk about it less. But yeah, they, it's but like just not, like matter of fact, you know. Yeah, it's just kind of like whatever. We've got other priorities, sort of thing. Um, but they're not supportive of Ukraine, you know. And they and and they and they they believe that. I mean, they're they're very much the believers in kind of this is this is NATO expansion and American imperialism and all that kind of crap. Yeah. Um, but I do think that they have been able to um, attract all of these people because these people don't feel like they have a home. In the mainstream, yeah, they anywhere. don't belong. You know? They don't belong they don't anywhere. Belong. And that, yeah, it, it, this is how these things happen. Um, it, it, so many thoughts. Jesus, <laughs> this is very stimulating. Um, a, a lot of freaks that you know kind of rise to power in democracies uh, only rise to power because they're able to attract all these people who feel left out. So these people didn't know they had like something in common. They were all over the place, you know, very misunderstood and nobody addressed their issues and nobody cared to explain to them what things mean. And nobody, I mean, uh, and I, all I can say with some, you know, um, that, you know, yeah, they, their issues, they weren't felt, they didn't feel like they were listened to. So they have found this person and, you know, they're, they're around this person now who will say outrageous things. But that, you know, to in their brain represents their interest, even if if this person does not. A lot, a lot of the times people will, you know, hide their corruption, you know, uh, under this kind of, um, you know, m like ma mask of caring about you. For instance, yeah. how does caring about Ukraine, because it's, it's a lot, it's like with the with the train derailment. What about us here? We should take care of us rather than some country God knows where. But these people don't know that these things are not mutually exclusive. So it, it, uh. that's true. But let me let me let me point out the much more pernicious and corrosive hiding of corruption. And that's underneath the the accepted norms and standards Absolutely. of government. Right. And that's and that is what people are disgusted with okay when they when they when they are attracted to these fringes they've they've often i mean sometimes attempted to engage in the kind of established manner been unsuccessful um you know maybe they maybe they didn't take long enough maybe they didn't put enough elbow grease in but in a lot of cases they they look at these people and sometimes they're disgusted by looking at them i mean i mean a lot of the people it's like this person's been my rep or my leader for 40 years. I mean, it's like, what the, what is going on here? You know, I mean, they see, I mean, like, like they see former presidents and, you know, big wig political figures and elites powwowing with Jeffrey Epstein. And yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, what is like, I mean, I, you know, again, it makes your mind go like, what is happening here? Like, why, why is it that, my leaders seem to be hanging out with like 
pedophiles and why and why is it that yeah and they're always and, and like then, and then of course they spiral into conspiracy yeah, theories but, yeah. but you know i and they're like they feel very removed it, that was president zelensky actually's winning strategy in the in the elections because he seemed like like people treated him like he's one of us it's very yeah. important and he was never you know he was never this wealthy influential he was a comedian yeah given he had money and the business was doing great but he was his manner of speaking, his manner of his attitude, his everything, it was very, people could relate to him. And I, 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 I kind of, I don't always agree with it, but I can relate to the fact when people look at somebody who's in charge and be like, is, is this person even real? Is this, yeah. does this person know what I need? How, how can this person know what I need if it's, you know? So, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, when I was in high school, there was this widely held, accepted notion among just tons of people that Democrats and Republicans, it's all a scam. They're the same party. They, they, they don't really want anything different. You know, they're, they're, just, they're just making believe. That was the whole, like, democracies make believe. You know, it's like, doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. You're going to get the same outcome um, no matter who, no matter what you do. And I, and, I, and I think that that really speaks to the way that um, American politics had been communized, that doctrine had been enforced. And I think, there's a, I think there is actually a lot of truth to that notion. I think Americans have good intuition. We, you know, we are, we're blunt and we're, we're crass, uh, yeah. you know, but, but, I, but I generally think that Americans saw fundamentally the truth, which was that yeah, Republicans were for economic integration with China and Russia. Democrats are for economic integration with China and Russia. There was something going on that Americans are like, something's wrong here. Something, something bad is happening here. I, I, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like the pictures I'm seeing. I don't like the way that there's, there's this one opinion constantly being forced into my face. That I don't like that I'm being told what to believe constantly. And that belief is globalization is great. Globalization is good. You should, you should, you know, all of these things are, and I think a lot of what we're seeing today is a rebellion against that. And the rebellion is ugly. Yeah. It's ugly. It's not nice. I think, I think we could have prevented it had we actually had real democratic political discourse like we had for a very long time, had the, had kind of the, the, the mainstream, so to speak, opened up and not been so doctrinaire. But the, the reality is we are experiencing in America, uh, it's not far left, far right. It's like it's up and down or, um, you know, like 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 one and the other. It's the it's the it's the mainstream versus the fringe. And I think there's a lot of blame to go around on all sides. Uh, yeah, I guess this is very interesting because uh, I know. I guess it feels a little bit like you're being dragged into a fight between two people that don't have your interest, uh, like it's not even an issue for them. And these people get fed up really easy because there isn't a healthy discourse, I would say. But I think it's a global crisis, not just, you know, in America. I think it's, we're look I, uh, maybe a hundred years from now, if we still exist, uh, because the hundred years is a long time, man. Now, well, I mean, I, I think what it indicates is. But I'm well, just saying, I mean, like, people are going to analyze this. Like, is this the decline? Is this is? Are we heading somewhere? No, with, nah? I, I, I really don't believe so. I think it's a new paradigm. So, so I mean, I, I think that I think that after World War II, we had a paradigm, and the paradigm was basically anti-communism yeah and it was it was it was based around very being, black and white very, very understandable white. yeah there, there there were those on the fringes that would say you know i mean they were really fringes then they weren't even politically powerful but it was like universities and stuff like that that would say well the ussr isn't so bad and we should blah. but really i mean pol political wise there was good healthy debate but it was largely within the confines of anti-communism and anti-authoritarianism and then the Cold War ended. And then yeah. suddenly there was kind of this notion of, wow, I guess, I guess you can, I guess we won. You know, I guess, yeah. I guess, I guess the whole world is, you know, perfectly liberal now and is going to be perfectly yeah, and liberal. I and I guess everybody is like us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
and and we're and we're headed in this direction and it's just a we matter of time. We agree on everything now. We agree on everything. We can make as much money as we want. We can be greedy. We can do it cuz because we are, you know, we are we won. So morally speaking, there's no reason to be morally upstanding. Who cares, you know? I yeah. mean, we we won. And that went on for 30 years until February 24th, 2022. And I but I think you you started seeing that was that was the breaking point, so to speak, but you started seeing the cracks before that. You started seeing the people being like wait a second, what is going on? You know, like, why can't we question this doctrine? There, there are huge problems here. There are huge problems with Russia. There are huge problems with China. There are huge problems with our relationships with these countries. All this blood money's coming in. There's, there's tons of issues, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but, but still, I think the doctrine won out. And I think it's still unclear to me whether we succeed in the shift. I mean, for me, I'm shifted. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm all paradigm shifted. I see February 24th as, as the breaking point. I see us in a new paradigm now, or at least I'm advocating a new paradigm. Um, but I, I'm unclear whether I, I, I certainly don't think this administration operates by a new paradigm. I think this administration's very much, um, ah, in well, the old paradigm. Well, well, so many people have worked so hard for the last 30 years to you know, to hold this crumbling to make a lot castle. Of money. Well, yeah, you see, you're being putting it bluntly. I'm like to hold this crumbling sand castle together. It was falling apart, and you, as you said, like you could tell everybody was feeling it. It's just so many people have poured so much hard work into still pretending we're we're not going anywhere. Like this is fine. This is fine. It's, yeah. It was so not fine. It was ridiculous. It was so bad. But like, no, no, no. We're still. It's good. It's like Europeans thinking they control Putin. They're like, no, 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 if we just have to talk him and we, if we talk and he'll make a promise, Absolutely. then, you know, everything's going to be okay. A promise. Because that's what it is. Like, do you promise not to? And he goes, yeah, yeah I like, promise. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And they're Whatever. like, see, we're, uh, see, we are we world leaders. We did it. It was our time. Yeah. And we did this, we did this, like, Five times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, like we, we, did the, we did the Chamberlain over and over and yeah, over again. Yeah, exactly. You know? Well, let's just sit and talk, because sitting and talking has worked so well. It's like this um, meme with these uh, Madagascar penguins, you know, like, we did it, boys. Conflict is no more. Peace yeah, 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 exactly. This is exactly what it was. And then imagine, like, all these people, they didn't go anywhere. They're still there. They're, They're still, still making everything. decisions. So they've everything. built this yeah. structure. And like, yes, of course, you know, your administration and most administrations still haven't shifted into this new paradigm because, well, it is very difficult to do it. And the structure is powerful. The self-preservation is very powerful. And they really have uh, co-opted a lot of the, you know, a lot of the structures that enabled them to maintain power. I mean, they have the money. They have the government for the most part. They have the media. You know, I mean, there's, there's, so, so, I mean, it's just kind of like, and that's not to say, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sound conspiratorial or like Elon Musk or anything like that. Like, I don't, I don't think everything that comes out of the mainstream media is a lie, but I think that, I think that these structures are certainly, you know, exist to preserve the status quo. Of and, course. And if, if you were in charge and if you, you want to stay in charge, yes, you don't want to change anything. Why would you? So I think we're. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I hope that we're seeing, I mean, my ideal is not that the fringes come to power, right? My ideal is that the, the mainstream realizes where it was wrong, sees the cracks, sees the problems and says, hey, we got to, you know, our doctrine was wrong. We should, we should not be so doctrinaire. We should not be so dogmatic. We've got to try new stuff. We've got to invite in new people. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to change change the status quo, you know, within the kind of, you know, incremental, reasonable progress that one can expect. And we'll, we're going to do something here and here and there and the other place, you know, but, but I, but I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not a, I don't believe in like revolution, right? I mean, I, I, no. I, I think you can fix this. I just think that if you don't, if you don't, there will be revolution. That's that's the problem. Is that if it, fixing this issue is a matter of survival, and I think most people will come to understand it sooner or later. Better sooner. We don't. Nobody needs a revolution. Revolution is a last kind of resort, and it it's all it brings a lot of you know. It's 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 never new life. It's never let's start a new all nice and pretty. It's never that. Believe me. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, Ukrainians uh, yeah. would know. 
We know. I mean, but we didn't have any. I mean, we were we were uh, that desperate. It's something that yeah. again nobody uh, in the West could ever understand because you've never. I mean, you've been very close to very unsavory things, you know, back in the like last year or two. When was that? I don't remember this point. I mean, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. January sixth was basically. I mean, that was a hint. Yeah. Of what is to come. Yeah. If the 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 mainstream, the the establishment, whatever you want to call it, is unable to recognize its own mistakes and start opening up, because it's just just tarnishing these people and saying they don't know what they're talking about and and calling them deplorable and looking down on them is going to get them even angrier it's going to cause even more backlash yeah it's like uh, i never want to compare january 6 to what we had here because those both like those events they have different origins and they have they stem from different things so uh why ukrainians had revolutions back in 91 in 2004 and 2014 is because we were pushed to the limits of our sovereignty it's very important, something people don't understand, because uh, people people love the whole tale of the U.S. orchestrated the yeah, blah blah blah. Again, uh, so stu- like such a stupid lie on so many reasons, because we were so close. Because Ukrainians chose their path, they as a country have established that you know yeah. moving towards EU, and then one day our pup. I mean, and then we had this very weird notion, which was. I don't know how it happened that he would do what we wanted him to do. He was a Kremlin puppet. Yanukovych was a Kremlin puppet all along. We knew it, but somehow our, you know, until like in, in, you know, intelligentsia, if you call, and all these people are like, well, he went to that summit. He's going to sign the Euro integration papers. It's all good now. I don't even know at this point why the hell we would think that would actually happen. But then he didn't sign anything. He didn't sign the agreement, and we understood at that very moment that we're that if we don't do something, we're done as a country. And it was the people who were standing on Maidan Square who were watching the thing on the big screen that realized that day that, you know, this, this, we were losing our sovereignty to Russia. Yeah, I mean, if I can, if I can try to put it in, 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 in a, maybe, a, maybe, a, maybe an American political context, I mean, it's, it really is one of these things where Yanukovych was more a Russian colonial governor than he was, than he was a president of Ukraine. You know? Russia has invested a lot of resources to bring him to power in Ukraine. He would have never achieved it. We have, see, we have seen it in yes. 2004 when he almost came to power and then the, uh, the other revolution stood up and kind of said, no, we cannot have this anymore. They have learned from their mistakes. For the next four years, they have been doing everything to undermine everything we've been standing for. And, you know, things happened. But so revolution is is not a good thing. It's not. It's a whole. Bu- you know what a revolution is? It's a whole bunch of dead people. That's what it is. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying like. It shouldn't happen. I mean, if it wasn't for the revolution of dignity, Ukraine would have been a very different country now or a country question mark. You know, yeah. we don't know. Totally. Um, but we we sacrificed a whole lot. And that includes people who were killed at Maidan by the police. I mean, the economy is struggling. Then, of course, the war began in, in Krim and in Donbass. So it's not good and people like to romanticize revolution a lot of the people who came to the capitol hill uh, on the 6th of january have a very bad idea of what revolution is again yeah. it's not a change of government it's like occupation it's not fun it's not yay we did it and nobody i mean it's and a, the us as a country is so big and so influential um so these things i should be addressed in a manner that we are all used to. We have instruments for that. We just have to have a magical thing that is called political will, which for years has been something akin to philosopher's stone. Yeah, for totally. It's unattainable. Everybody likes to pretend they're a leader. Everybody's a leader. Everybody's an opinion leader. Everybody's a political leader. Everybody wants to be president all the time. It's weird how many people want to be president all the time. Because I don't want to be a president because that's a very bad job. That is a very hard, 
not good. I mean, people who want, I, I have know. respect for, you, you know, it's my thing. You know, I don't have to. But it's a very, very hard job. But everybody wants to be one. Do you have, but like, and nobody ever questions, like, do you even know what political will is? And nobody's seen it. People talk about it all the time. <laughs> like, it's well, like maybe a that's, unicorn. Maybe that's a- Maybe that's a good question for next time, next yeah. week. I mean, I, I I have a lot of thoughts on that. I've worked in anti-corruption for a very long time where everyone just constantly talking about the political will to solve this, the political will to solve that. And it's like, like I mean, I mean, the reality is with political will, you got to put in a lot of effort to build it. That's what yeah. you do. That's what, that's what, that's what we're doing here. That's what, that's what, I mean, that's why, that's why crazy stuff that you you know, wouldn't think is all that important, like Twitter or social media or whatever, or or just, you know, mainstream media or whatever is important because it it is political will. It builds political will for, for you know, certain things. So, um, but it is, but it is elusive. It's like, it is a unicorn. You know, it and, is. And a, and everybody talks about it. Nobody's ever seen it, I, but we I, need it. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's, yes, right. And I mean, and, and, and I, and I'm, I guess I'm sad to say that thus far, I have not seen the political will among the mainstream to to make the changes necessary to prevent uh you know revolution from the from the fringes. Listen, we know? can't even agree on things like ooh, we're all going to drown in a couple of years. Let's fix that. I mean, even that's not a thing that, you know. Well, as as I think you pointed out earlier, I think the hardest 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 thing to do, the hardest is to admit you made a mistake. Yeah. And I think that I think that right now we are at this crazy moment where it just has become extremely clear that our political leadership for 30 years has made really, 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 really really big mistakes, including almost just giving away for free the unipolar moment. I mean, I mean, just like just like disastrous mistakes, you know, and 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 and. And they won't admit it, and 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 they they won't admit it, and and they they'll make endless excuses, and the more excuses they make, the more radicalized Americans are, because they're like, we know you made a mistake, just say you made the mistake, you know. I mean, it's 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 becoming the 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 tension yeah. of that hypocrisy. Yeah, it's the tension. So it's the tension of the hypocrisy, and people can feel it, and they can it's feel like it. Everybody knows. Everything and you know, like we know, you know, you know that we know. Just like, just and but people love to pretend like everything. I mean, is it's like okay. it's like Angela Merkel coming out and being like, "Up, oh, I knew the whole time." Yes. Oh, that you know, is like, such like, a, like, that is like, such like, a like, good like, example. I, 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 that I woman. Knew, I knew. Oh God, I that knew, woman. I knew the Russians were going to weaponize gas. Okay, then why'd you build the pipeline? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's like, she's like, we we did everything we could. No, you. You no, didn't. you didn't. No, you like you we obviously, know. Obviously, like, if like, you did, we wouldn't have had this problem right now. Like, yeah, we were what? Yeah, yeah, about the. I knew. I, I now I remember this interview because it was great. It was great and, and not in the. Like, it was weird as hell. But like, we knew that Russia would weaponize gas. Is yeah. the funniest. Not joke. I've heard because we told you we've we've literally been yelling about it for, and everybody was pretending they hear. Well, oh then she's, she's like, she's like, oh no, Minsk was good because it gave Ukraine the time to prepare to, to fight. It's like, uh, did you miss the entire fight in the Donbass? No, no, it's not like, even are, that. Are you crazy? It's not even that. Minsk was good to help Ukraine give, so Ukraine can prepare. But you will not give Ukraine anything to prepare Any with. Yeah. This is insane. Prepare with no, what? It, it was- Sticks. What right. Molotov? Five thousand helmets. Yeah, five thousand helmets and light bulbs. That was it, that was after the full scale invasion. Yes, too, it like was in too. To it. Like you should prepare, but we won't give you stuff, and we yeah. won't sell you stuff, and we won't teach you stuff. Yeah, right. right. Uh, and the, people don't like when people uh, when they they feel like people treat them like idiots. Nobody likes that. Exactly. Nobody likes to feel stupid. Because do you think we're stupid? And I, I, that's why people get radicalized because they're tired of, exactly. because they're trying to be treated like kids in the kindergarten, you know? Because they realize the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. That, oh my that, God. That, yes. I that's mean, true. That, that actually, 
these people have no clue what they're talking about. They claim to be the adults in the room, but they've they've made. I mean, I mean, I just I can't even tell you. I mean, if if Angela Merkel actually went up there and said, "Well, you know, I probably, you know, we probably could have handled that better." You know, I mean, I you know, I there there Germany Germany made some mistakes. We were on the wrong path. You know, I came in and and this was Gerhard Schroeder's decision and I had a, there was a lot of people pressuring me from various lobbies and of course it was my call. And I thought but, Russia but has changed I and thought I Russia believed, had changed. Yeah, blah blah blah. But yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, people get sick of it. Yeah. They get sick of just the incessant, you know, self justifications and lying. Because, I mean, like, lying. because I know better. Because, well, back in the day, that would, you know, that was our kind of prognosis. And no, no, no. Like, ugh. I, I mean, and, and it's it's across the board. It's all of them. It's yeah, all it's of all them. All of them. It's it's been it's been the last thirty years, and that's why. I mean, I mean, look no further than that to find polarization. That is it. That is the reason for it. It's not. It's not social media, although that has exacerbated it. It's not. It's not that the fringes popped out of nowhere. It's this crap, you know. I, mean, I think the 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 worst part about this is that often they will choose lying over telling the truth, even if there's no reason for it. Just yeah, for because it's, no because it's, reason. Because it's ego. Yeah. I mean, it's literally. It literally gets to the point where it's ego. It's the worry that you're going to lose the opportunity of that lobbying job if you admit a mistake. People aren't going to think. As well of you, if you admit a mistake, you know, people, people are, you have to be, you have to, you have this pressure to be perfect, you know, and that, and that every decision you made was perfect because you're the adult in the room. You're the elite. Last you know? time we spoke about, you know, Habermas and whatnot, who just cannot, you know, because we're the smart ones, right? We wrote all of these books about all these smart things. And it probably will mean if we're wrong about this thing, then all the other things what are else? probably wrong. That's they're worried about dominoes. Absolutely. That, that, oh my God, if we were wrong on this, what else are we wrong on? And it's like, bro, that's not how it works. Like free and open debate and discourse needs to self-correct. Democracy needs to self-correct. We need to recognize our errors in order to self-correct. It's the reason we haven't self-corrected over 30 people years. People make mistakes. They it's, do. It's okay. All unless, the time. Unless you're corrupt, which then is a whole different discussion. If you have made a decision honestly and without, you know, influence yeah. or, well, crap, things happen. Uh, that, well, that's actually, that's a great, that's a great comparison because Gerhard Schroeder is corrupt. Yes. And I, and I can, I can completely understand why he doesn't want to admit any mistakes because you know, if he, that's why, no mea culpas, because, yeah. because if he did, it would, it would implicate his money and his dealings with Russia and all that kind of stuff. Merkel, I don't think Merkel's you corrupt. See, I, I don't think she's know. Just like, yeah, right. Well, now we, we don't know. We because, don't know. Because she's she acting would. like Schroeder. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. that, that actually makes you feel like, okay, well, maybe she does have something to hide. Maybe she is corrupt. You but know? the thing I mean, is, she, she doesn't have to be, you know, like, we, we can, uh, if she said, I'm, if she proved that she wasn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, she yeah. does not, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a bit naive in, in the way that I go, like, I always think be better, you know, of people than I probably should sometimes. So I know for a fact that some of these people just made mistakes, which costs a lot of lives because making mistakes of this magnitude is a bit different than, you know, just like, you know, counting wrong and then yeah. counting somewhere. But like, still, it's a thing that exists. It's a thing that exists, and mostly it's mistakes. It's it's I mean, learning I, 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 from I, I, that is important. There, boy, there's a classic American saying that's like, don't, don't, don't see malfeasance where incompetence would suffice, you know. And yeah. and it and it's a lot of the time it's it's mistakes, it's path dependency, it's stupid things you do, it's stuck in doctrinaire ideology, it's stuck in dogma, whatever. It's stubbornness, it's ego, it's a lot it's of stubbornness, things. it's ego, it's all that kind of stuff. But but I mean, the only way you grow. The only way we grow as societies and, the, and move on is with honesty and openness. And we have had none of that from our leaders for 30 years. And that's why somebody like Donald Trump comes who, I mean, arguably, uh, you know, it lies like never lies, never stop coming out of his mouth. But 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 there's this openness and honesty and this kind of feeling of lack of hypocrisy. He's about honest him. in his lying and he's, he's passionate and he's right. a, and he looks human and all these things. Genuineness, are very attractive, authenticity. Yeah. All of these things are very, very attractive in an age where we just don't have this at all anymore because, again, of the communization of our societies, because everything has become so doctrinaire, so party line, so so you do, you do not you do not divert 
from 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 the talking points and people are just absolutely sick of this you know in our little circle we call it moral bankruptcy yes that's what it is yeah. that's what it is moral bankruptcy melania wonderful to speak with you as always that was that was it that was it that was a great discussion yeah. <laughs> till till next time till next time <laughs>